Hey, welcome everybody. It's Amanda Williams at the MacArthur Memorial with Jim Zobel. And today we're gonna to be talking about something that we call MacArthur's Pearl Harbor. Now, December 7th is um, a date that's etched in the minds of many Americans, um, but few are aware that there was also an attack on the Philippines and that really these attacks were just a number of coordinated attacks by the Japanese that day. Um, within hours of the attack at Pearl Harbor, um, the Philippines and American Commonwealth at the time um, was attacked by the Japanese, but because of the international dateline, it's technically December 8th when that happens in the Philippines. Um, the attack there, I think, is arguably even more devastating than the attack on American forces at Pearl Harbor, perhaps not in terms of loss of life, but certainly in terms of American um, and Philippine military capabilities um, in the Pacific. Um, at the time that that attack happened, General MacArthur was in charge of American and Filipino forces in the Philippines. And so there's a lot of questions about that day. This is a very controversial topic. Um, who is to blame? What went wrong? And so today we're gonna basically just try to walk you through what happened that day. Um, and talk a little bit about the blame um, that is, is kind of in, involved in that. We'll try. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> so again, it's a big topic. It's very controversial, um, but we're gonna give it a good try. So Jim, just to start us off with, um, MacArthur is obviously in the Philippines. He's been there since 1935, correct? What is his assessment of the uh, basically the situation with Japan at that point and how defensible in his mind are the Philippines in the summer fall of 1941? Well, Japan, of course, had been uh, in the China war since about 1937, uh, very experienced. Uh, then in 1941, uh, in July, they moved into Southern Indochina, French Indochina. And this was something that Roosevelt had warned him about before, that if they did that, if they militarized these bases there, that the United States would have to take action. So when the Japanese do that in July, uh, Roosevelt recalls MacArthur to the colors. He had retired in 37. He brings him back as Lieutenant General and he creates United States Army Forces Far East. Uh, MacArthur is overly enthusiastic. He's confident that he can build a defense force there. He's been working since about 35 to build this Philippine army. Not a lot had been really taken off the ground because there was no money uh, to do all this training uh, at that time. There was really nothing to equip them with. But in July, everything gains a big momentum forward. Uh, the War Department is going to start pumping in a lot of air power. Uh, that's their main belief it, that they can stop the Japanese Sea because when they they created that U.S. Army Forces Far East, they also cut off the oil uh, to Japan and uh, they also uh, like froze the assets. So now Japan has to look to the south to get that oil supply and the Americans know that. So they start throwing in, they think they, they decide they want to throw in about 200 of the new modern weapon, the B-17 into the Philippines by about April of 42, throw in about 240 uh, P-40s, uh, which is the, I guess the latest, you know, airplane that the United States has at that time. And they want this to be the deterrent to keep the Japanese from going south. However, they, the Japanese know that that is their main obstacle to going south. And so everything is planned on getting rid of that air force, the, you know, very small that's, that's there. By December, uh, they have 35 B-17s there. They have about 90 P-40s. Uh, they've got one squadron that's still outfitted with the old P-35s. Uh, and Basically, uh, when December comes, MacArthur was still saying, I needed till April. And he would say the Japanese won't attack till April. As, but the thing is, is back in the War Department, most of them are saying, no, they're not going to attack till April. Uh, but November of 1941, the diplomatic moves really get uh, very intense. Uh, the, the Japanese and the Americans can't come to agreement about what the Japanese ha are going to do in China. The Japanese have been there for four years. They don't want to let this go. The Americans won't stop back in Chang. And so diplomatic relations are breaking down. Uh, this is all relayed to the Philippines. And in late November, they tell MacArthur, uh, be on defensive, but don't make an overt act, you know, to bring on war. Mm -hmm. He's got all the units uh, 
plans ready to go? What's going to happen if war breaks out? You know, he's got the Northern Luzon Force, Wainwright, Southern Luzon Force. He's going to inculcate all these Philippine army units into these groups. So the plans are there and the Air Corps is working uh, overtime because they're getting a lot uh, they've got one radar set up at this point. They've got seven of them there, but only one is set up at the EBA airfield there. And they're getting a word from December 4th through the 7th that they're picking up flights off of uh, Luzon. And so they're really worried about this. They're also uh, doing night training. They've got all these brand new P-40s. They've only got a few hours in them, but Brereton, who's the commander that comes out there to take over the Far East Air Forces in early November, he's got them working on night training in that early December time frame. And they're seeing phantom airplanes there. So the Japanese are very okay. active, yes, yeah. over the Philippines at this time. So the Air Corps is really on alert about this. And so whereas when war comes on December 7th, you know, your air defenses are, are basically nil. Uh, the, you know, Brereton had worried about this before he came out there, that you're sending out all these planes, but you've got no ability to defend these with any aircraft or, you know, materials like that. They've only got the one station up. So the Air Corps is alert. They've got really just a little bit of time in those P-40s because they had just gotten out there. Um, a lot of the pilots had just gotten out there. So they're not really familiar with everything. Um, they're working, hoping to have it ready by April, but December 7th, you know, there it comes. So whereas MacArthur is confident um, towards out everyone, and even on December 6th is still saying they won't attack till April, you know, how much is he portraying that, you know, just as a, a face of confidence, um, because he knows about the diplomatic moves. He knows that Caruso, uh, being sent to help Nomura was not the guy you're sending to make peace at the time. So um, very unprepared for war uh, when it when it comes on on December eighth. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously Pearl is attacked December seventh. Um, how how do they find out about that in the Philippines? Who finds out first, and how does that trickle to MacArthur? Well, we know that the Asiatic fleet under Admiral Hart, uh, he gets word at about uh, 2.30. They pick it up, that air raid Pearl Harbor. You know, this is no drill. They pick up that radio. 2.30 in the morning? Yeah, and they're at the headquarters in the Marsman building. Uh, and then uh, they send Admiral uh, Purnell over to Kaye 1 Victoria, which is MacArthur's headquarters. And Sutherland, who's the chief of staff uh, for MacArthur, he's living there at the time. Like he's on a cot. A lot of the other, other officers are too, because it's a very intense time frame going on. You know, they think right. this thing is going to kick off. And, but Sutherland will always say he heard it on the radio. But despite that, uh, Sutherland calls MacArthur at about 3.40 a.m., tells him that Pearl's been bombed. Then he calls uh, General Brereton at Nielsen Field headquarters. Uh, which is also in Manila, and tells him that uh, Pearl has been bombed. Uh, the units, uh, MacArthur comes to headquarters at about five o'clock that morning. The staff is there. They send out the orders to the units, you know, that this has happened, um, but it doesn't get to everyone. I think that the Air Corps guys at EBA don't find out till about six in the morning when it comes over the radio, you know, but they had been up that night because they got uh, a word that Japanese flights were off the coast. So they had been flying that night as well. So it's kind of haphazard how it comes into everyone. But by that morning, pretty much everybody knows. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a couple of the personalities that we're going to be talking about. You mentioned Sutherland, Brereton. Can you give us a little background on all these guys? Well, Richard Sullivan was MacArthur's chief of staff. Uh, he uh, had been in the infantry, I think it was the 15th infantry in China in the 30s. And when Eisenhower uh, had been chief of staff for MacArthur, he went home on this vacation and they brought our, his uh, counterpart, this guy Ord got killed and they brought in Sutherland. And when Eisenhower went home, MacArthur realized he could deal with Sutherland just you know as well as, as Eisenhower. So he came on staff as the chief of staff at that point. Uh, he's a very brusque guy. He's kind of a gatekeeper. That'll be a big problem on this day of December 8th. Lewis Brereton is a um, guy who graduated from the Naval Academy, but then he went into the Air Corps. He was very close with Billy Mitchell uh, all during that time when they're really figuring out how the Air Corps is going to work. Uh, Hap Arnold had great belief in him when they start sending out all these planes to the Philippines. Uh, they give MacArthur the choice of who he can pick. Uh, 
uh, to be his air commander. And MacArthur picks Brereton to come out there. Thing is, Brereton gets out there and immediately uh, MacArthur sends him on these trips to uh, outline the ferry routes, how they're going to be bring all these B-17s to the Philippines, through Australia and all these different island groups. And so pretty much all of November, he's gone. Uh, and they don't wow. they don't have all these discussions about what are we going to do with uh, the Rainbow Five plan if war starts? You know, how is all this stuff going to work? You know, there's really no uh, build up, you know, in that sense, because they're still looking at, yeah. at at April at that time frame um, as well. You've got, you know, all your, you know, Oren Grover, who runs a 24th Pursuit Group, Harold George runs at Fifth Interceptor Command, Eubank runs the Bomber Command of the B-17s, you know, who had just been sent out as recently as uh, September and October, um, mm -hmm. these 35 bombers that they have here, he'll run those, and so you've got all these different uh, people that are going to play very decisive roles, but I, I guess the, you know, the main controversy comes from that Brereton Sutherland MacArthur link, you know, that morning about who's really talking to who and what is being said. And that's where the, you know, uh, you know, there's been extensive work that's been done on this, you know, since the like 46 and uh, Bill Barsh, especially, and he's laid it out the timeline pretty well in his book that came out the December 8th book. Um, but it's, it's just that, that deal between Sutherland MacArthur and Hart that still has this fog about it. Okay. Well, can you can you walk us through this timeline? So MacArthur's found out, they're starting to kind of put the word out to the different units across the Philippines. Um, yeah. Brereton, what, coming to MacArthur's headquarters to try to talk to him or is he calling him? What, yeah, well, about, what's happening? About five o'clock, Brereton shows up at Calle One Victoria. Right. And that's MacArthur's headquarters. And he's going there to meet MacArthur uh, to put forward this idea that they want to bomb uh, Formosa. They want to bomb the harbor there because they really don't have photo recon of all the airfields there. I think Colin Kelly, the famous pilot who gets shot down about five days later on December 5th, he was able to go up and, and he flew a photo recon. But they hadn't been doing this because the War Department told him, you know, you can't, don't prompt a war. And so that's what MacArthur was okay. putting the and, kibosh on that. And but when Formosa, to, Formosa when, is where the Japanese attack. Is yes, coming. that's where okay. all their bases, uh, all the zeros, all the type 96s, all the type ones will come from the, the four bases there at, at Formosa. Um, but when Brereton comes there, he puts forward this idea. Sutherland does not let him see MacArthur, tells him he's in conference. Um, but he says, go ahead and get prepared, but you can't make any move without MacArthur giving you orders. Then uh, at about 7.15, Brereton calls back again, says, I want to put this thing, you know, together. And um, Sutherland is like, MacArthur is still, you know, can't be disturbed at this time. And Brereton says, well, I have to see him. And, and um, Sutherland goes in and sees MacArthur and comes out and says, no, still hold off for this time. But between five and that seven period, you know, no bombers have been loaded, no fuel has been put on. You know, it's, there's uh, really this slowness by everybody that's going on. Uh, then at about 7.55, they pick up that you've got these uh, bombers coming in um, over the top of the Philippines. And these are the two army groups that had taken off from Kato and uh, Choshu and Formosa at about 5.30. See, most of Formosa had been clogged in with fog, but those Southern bases didn't get uh, you know, socked in. So they were able to take off about 5.30 and they'll show up over the Philippines, Cape Bohiador, which is right up in the Northwest, about 7.50. Eva Raybar, Radar picks them up about 7.55. They throw up um, the 20th and the 17th pursuit groups uh, to meet up around Tarlac, and that's where they'll hopefully intercept this group. They throw up the 34th out of Del Carmen to cover uh, Clark Field. They're those old P-35s. Everybody else is in the P-40s. The thing is, the Japanese uh, have this all planned out. They were going to hit Baguio and the northern airfield at uh, Tugegarao, I think it's called. And these were the two army bomber units, the uh, Ki-20 ones in the KI-48s that came from Choshu and Kato. And then at about 8.30, they hit Baguio and they hit that other place. Those uh, P-40s waiting at Tarlac, never see them at all. So then what happens is 
uh, when all those guys had gone up, they had also put up all the B-17s. And so now you can't load or refuel them because they're all up uh, thinking that this uh, raid was coming in at Clark Field. Now at about 11 o'clock, um, they all come back down. About 10.30 after two hours, all those P-40s are running out of gas. So the 17th and the 20th land at Clark. Even the 17th is based out of Nichols Field down in Manila. And as well, the third is there waiting at EBA. The 34th goes back to Del Carmen. All those B-17s land. They've got revetments for the, uh, the 20th uh, Pursuit Squadron. They've got revetments for the B-17s, but the 17th Pursuit is just lined up wingtip to wingtip right on the hangars. Uh, and then what happens is, you know, during that time at about 10 o'clock, Brereton had called MacArthur because they knew about the, the Baguio bombings. As well, Davao had been bombed early that morning, about 6.30 from an aircraft carrier, the Ryuho. MacArthur knows all this. You know, 6.15, they knew about uh, Davao. Uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock, they know about Baguio. Uh, Brereton again calls Sutherland, says, you know, we gotta run this thing. Clark is, is if we lose Clark, the whole show is over. And, and uh, again, Sutherland says we're on this defensive uh, posture right now. But then 15 minutes later, MacArthur calls Brereton. And Brereton tells him what he wants to do. And MacArthur says, I give you total you know, offensive um, action. You can take whatever measures you want. Brereton tells him he wants to bomb Formosa. You know, this is where it comes in because Sutherland says that he had only asked to do recon. You know, Brereton said he had been asking to do this. And the thing is, is does MacArthur know that Brereton's been there at that point? Because when, when Brereton calls him at 10 o'clock, Sutherland says, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden MacArthur calls him right back and says, I give you full, you know, capability to do what you need to do. Now we know that MacArthur had gotten confirmation of Baguio and Davao at about 9.45. Was he waiting for that? You know, that we, we still aren't sure of. But anyway, uh, now Brereton has got this uh, offensive. So when all those bombers land at 11, uh, he is meeting with Eubanks at, at Nielsen during that 10 o'clock period. Eubanks, the bomber commander goes back to Clark, gets there about 11 o'clock when all those B-17s are landing. Now they're starting to plan for this bombing raid uh, that they wanna pull off at about two o'clock in the afternoon against those that uh, Takao Harbor. Thing is, now at about 11.20, EBA picks up the other Japanese flights because the fog had left Japan or Formosa at about 8.15 and that uh, the Kanoya coup, the first coup, uh, all these type ones, type 96s that are gonna take off from Tainan and Takao all get into the air about 8.15. And then you've got the zeros uh, from uh, the uh, Tainan and, and Takao bases that are going to take off to uh, guard them. It's about a hundred and you know some bombers. It's about a hundred and some zeros. They're going to fly. They both have the idea that they're going to hit EBA bases as well as uh, Clark Field. The thing is, is, the night before they were planning on hitting Clark and Nichols Field, but when that those weather of planes went down by the coast of Lingayen and the planes went up from EBA, the, the Japanese picked up their radios. And so they knew they were gonna have to hit EBA instead of Nichols. They changed the plan. Now you've got the two groups that are gonna go hit uh, Clark and EBA mostly about the same time. At 11.30, uh, EBA again, this radar station picks up, you've got a flight about 70 miles west of Lingayen Gulf. And 10 minutes later, they say you've got a flight right over Lingayen Gulf and they're heading down. The thing is, is that the 24th Pursuit Commander calls up uh, the 17th Pursuit. He calls up the 3rd Pursuit uh, to come to Clark, but then he, well, he calls the 21st Pursuit at Nichols. He calls the 3rd Pursuit to come up at, and to guard Clark, but then he sends him to Manila and says that, you know, guard Manila Bay. And he also orders the 34th, those P-35s to come back to uh, Clark Field, but they don't get the message. It doesn't get through to them. Mm -hmm. 
Now you've got everybody really worried. You've got um, Sutherland calling Brereton back at 1156 saying, what's going on? 10 o'clock, you know, we said, give you the credence. What's happening? Brereton tells them what's going on, says we've got these flights that are coming down towards Eba and Clark. At about 1145, uh, Grover uh, knows again that they're getting closer. Now it looks like it's uh, coming, uh, still not deciding where it's gonna go. At about 1210, he orders that 17th pursuit that's still there at Clark up in the air and puts them over Manila, you know, cause he still thinks it's all going to Manila. At about 1215, Fifth Interceptor Commander Harold George radios uh, Clark Air Base to grow, you know, Grover the 20th pursuit and says, you know, everybody to Clark. This thing is going to Clark. The 21st is called, or you know, had gone down to um, Manila Bay after originally going there, and they don't get the word. However, the C flight, you know, there's three ABC flights that take off. The C flight that took off with the the 21st, they don't get that word, so they still go to Clark. And then as well, the third, uh, the, the BC flights went over Manila Bay, but the A flight didn't get the word and they're still over EBA. And so those very parse groups are only a few planes. Those are the only guys that are gonna be there over Clark. Uh, and then you've got the Takao coup, you got the Kanoya coup, and you've got the first coup of, of the Tainan group that, that comes in and they just start plastering uh, both EBA as well as um, Clark Field. And uh, the 20th pursuit never got the word to get off the ground, uh, the confusion going on. And uh, when the bombs, uh, when they see the planes in the air, three of those guys uh, get up in the air, but the rest of them get uh, pretty much wiped out trying to take off. Uh, pretty much all your B-17s, you're gonna lose uh, 12 of the 18. They had moved about uh, 16 of two squadrons of bombers from uh, Clark. They had moved those down to Del Monte earlier. That's also a big bone of contention of who ordered that move. You know, MacArthur Sutherland would always say they ordered it. Brereton would always say they ordered it. But uh, those half that stay up at, at Clark are going to get creamed. And so after, you know, this attack, you've lost your 20th pursuit. You've got, you know, a great part of your third pursuit wiped out. You've lost, um, you know, a, a, a about a flight of your uh, uh, 21st pursued squadron and your only intact squadron is, is the 17th. I mean, the 34th, those P-35s, they don't take off for Clark until they see the smoke over Clark, you know, cause they, they never get the word, you know? So it's, it's mistakes on everybody's part. The Japanese are really good at what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's a lot of confusion. I mean, it's going from a peacetime to a wartime stance overnight when everybody completely is unprepared mm -hmm. you know they're they were trying to get ready but they they weren't ready at all now there's a theory and i think macarthur kind of encourages this idea that um he's a little confused about the status of the philippines that morning um basically he says that it's indeterminate and he's a little hesitant maybe to take actions in those early hours because he's not sure uh, either the the loyalty of the Philippines or perhaps he's talking with President Kazon and maybe trying to figure out is it you know is the Philippines um, going to be part of this war against the Japanese or is it better for the Philippines right. and the Filipinos to uh, perhaps try to stay as neutral as possible um, what are what are your thoughts on that? Why does MacArthur kind of encourage that perception? Well, from you know all these books, you know, and all the stuff we have at the Barsh papers, um, everybody's looked to him. And MacArthur's own words, especially, and that's the problem that the Air Corps had. Was MacArthur's still kind of on that November twenty eighth stance? You know, let the Japanese make the first overt move. Uh, the thing is, is they know about Davao, you know, being bombed at six thirty that morning. They know about Baguio. And when, when uh, Brereton is coming and meeting with Sutherland and Sutherland's still saying, we're taking a defensive posture, um, um, we're waiting for an overt. And, and Brereton was like, wasn't Pearl Harbor, you know, the major overt act? Um, after the war, when uh, Lewis Morton was writing that Fall of the Philippines, the Green Series for the Army, he wrote MacArthur. And MacArthur wrote him back and said, yeah, the Philippines had a very indeterminate international stance 
And it's almost like he's, you know, saying they, they had this neutrality um, that they were still wondering about. Now, people uh, like John Buckley, the guy who runs a PT boats, you know, that takes MacArthur off and was very much, you know, in all this. He said that he blamed Kazon as Kazon saying that uh, he's in MacArthur's ear saying we want to stay neutral. This is going to. But when Kazon goes back to the United States and he talks with Eisenhower, he says MacArthur was still under this idea that we were neutral. You know, so it, it's again that fog of, of, of who's really saying what, you know, because all these things come out, you know, 10 some years later. I mean, 46 Brereton comes out with the first book saying that it was MacArthur's delay of not letting them make this attack on Formosa, you know, early that morning, that was the reason why everybody gets caught on the ground. Um, MacArthur and Sutherland would come back saying, we ordered those B-17s down to Del Monte. Uh, they had kiboshed all of them going there because that 20 that seventh bomb group was supposed to be coming in right after that they would base at del monte you didn't have enough room for all four squadrons of the 19th bomb group to go down there um so again it comes down to this big fog of they didn't get it all done and yeah and uh, it, all those early books by like uh, whitney uh, MacArthur's aide, you know, his military sector by J Charles Willoughby, the G2 guy, you know, they'll all say, you know, back up this MacArthur claim of this neutrality um, um, and this waiting for the overt act, but, you know, still, you know, wasn't Pearl that, wasn't mm -hmm. you know, Deval and, and, and Baggio that, and it just seems like every, everybody, you know, and it, everybody was moving in slow motion, you know, the, they, they, if Brereton's got the approval to, to you know, get ready at five. Nothing's been done before, you know, eight thirty when they take off. You know, because of that that scare that comes in. So it's 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 a lot of everyone. You know, it's it's a lot of everyone. So there's always a kind of interest among historians in assigning blame for the day. Um, Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> I blame the Japanese. They made the attack. Um, but I mean, I, I would think that the consensus is kind of, you know, MacArthur is in charge there. Sure. At the end of the day, it's his responsibility. So, I mean, do you agree with that assessment? Well, pretty much all the historians have come out and said they should have done something. You know, either, you know, at, at 8.30 when that first, uh, when they first go up in the air that morning, they should have sent them to Deval then or to uh, Del Monte. Uh, airport then on Mindanao. Uh, there's, uh, you know, they should have done something, either make the raid on Formosa early that morning. Um, people always talk about they didn't have uh, uh, air support. You know, the fighters couldn't have gone with the B-17s all the way to Formosa, uh, the fog issue, but um, Barsh lays it out pretty well. If they had left, you know, like uh, s s daylight that morning, even though they weren't ready, they couldn't have, you know, they weren't ready to do anything like they had no plan or anything like that. They would have been there basically right when the fog cleared and all those planes. So it had to been a, you know, a thousand to one shot that they arrived right at the right time. Uh, the thing that everybody always points out though, that was after Pearl Harbor, there was no spare parts coming. There was no aviation gas coming. You know, all these you know, planes are very precise instruments that need to be worked on, you know, nonstop. Uh, and so eventually, you know, it, it, it wouldn't have, have made a difference. But uh, you, you, you wonder, you know, if, if they had been able to pull off this thousand to one shot over Formosa, would that have done something? You know, but it's just, it's, it's a lot of bad luck. Mm -hmm. a, a, just a, a great deal but it comes down to they should have done something and they they didn't do anything mm -hmm. and i guess the political confusion over the status of the philippines obviously doesn't help either in yes. any planning and you know washington had had sent all that stuff out there with 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 no defenses you know mm -hmm. they said all that's going to come later but even Brereton, before he came, comes to the Philippines, you know, he's in Marshall's face saying, what are you doing sending all this stuff out there when you don't have anything to defend it? And Marshall was like, well, you know, it's, it's going to come, you know, it, it'll, it'll be out yeah. there, you know. Yeah, it's kind of a perfect storm. Uh, unfortunately for the United States, yeah, and for the Philippines. Yeah, so
um, after Pearl Harbor, there's obviously a big shakeup in um, Hawaii. You know, uh, Admiral Kimmel, you know, there are gonna be people there that are gonna get in trouble for that um, and be out basically. Um, does that happen in the Philippines? I mean, clearly it doesn't happen in the case of MacArthur, but what about Brereton and other people? No, uh, none of them. Brereton will go on to command, you know, in Europe, the bomber forces there, the, you know, the Ploesti, you know, raids, the Operation Market Garden, a lot of that stuff. Um, MacArthur is not called on the carpet by anyone. Uh, Arnold, mm -hmm. Claire Chenault, uh, uh, Marshall will say they still can't understand what happened. Uh, you know, that right. morning, uh, MacArthur gets two messages from the War Department. First, at uh, this message 733 telling him, uh, you know, diplomatic relations are going to break off. He gets that at about five o'clock when he gets to headquarters. Then they send him this other message at about seven or about 530 saying uh, Pearl Harbor has been bombed, you know, initiate Rainbow Five. And MacArthur doesn't answer him. It's not until about 7.55, Leonard Garreau from the War Department calls MacArthur and says, what's going on there? And MacArthur says, we've had, you know, uh, nothing really going on and says that our tails are up in the air, but doesn't answer why he didn't, you know, answer those questions. So a lot of these guys are going to wonder, but they're not going to, you know, who are you going to send out there? You call MacArthur home, hey, we're sending you out to the Philippines to surrender, you know? Um, so when after MacArthur gets to Australia, you know, he's this he's the press back home as well as Roosevelt and, you know, everybody have have made him the hero, you know, holding out and and baton and they're not they're not going to, you know, cashier him at that point. You know, the war is going on. Then after the war, he's supreme commander, head of, you know, Japan. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's not it's not brought up then, even though they're having all those Pearl Harbor investigations you know, directly after the war. So in the Philippines, no, nobody, nobody really pays for it. You know? mm -hmm. And I think even right after the attack- Except the people the that get killed, you know, they, they pay the ultimate price. Yeah, but I think even after the attack um, on December 8th, when Roosevelt's asked about it by the press corps, I think he totally evades, you know, he doesn't really want to discuss that. And then yeah, later on- off. Yeah, he's like, I, I'm not going to talk about MacArthur. I'm not going to talk about whatever mistakes might have happened there, because I think even in the, the press, there's this sense that they had advance warning more than the guys at, at Pearl did, clearly. So why did that turn out so badly? Well, um, I think the, you know, the, Roosevelt... the press doesn't, you know, they, they don't really get a lot about what happened. You know, I mean, it's it's not yeah. until the the 1990s really that we get the full story, you know, when uh, when Bill Barsh comes out with that, you know, December 8th, 1941. I mean, he's got it laid out, you know, timeline by timeline, mainly because Barsh, you know, wrote every single person that was in the Air Corps that was still alive and had it, you know, could, could, could make a full description of, you know, what actually happened that morning. Mm -hmm. Well, you bring us to kind of the close of our discussion today. Um, two major MacArthur biographers, um, E. Clayton James and William Manchester, say that it's very kind of easy to assign blame for December 8th, but that it's still really hard to figure out the exact timeline and understand how in the world this happened the way it did. Um, according to James, there's lots of gaps and contradictions in sources. Um, obviously, he was writing quite a, a while ago, but William Manchester points out again that, you know, it's just very hard to clarify. And again, he wrote his bio of MacArthur quite a, a long time ago. But um, what kind of new evidence has emerged since then? You mentioned Barsh. Um, what, what do we know? What evidence is emerging? And what can people find here at the memorial to help flesh out this controversial timeline? Yeah, Barsh is the man. Uh, he wrote Doomed at the Start, which is the story of all the pursuit pilots uh, that came out in the early 90s. Then after Jeffrey Perret's book came out in 96, uh, Old Soldiers, where he basically blamed everything on Brereton, uh, Barsh, that, that inst instigated Barsh to write the December 8th book because he was like, you know, this is ridiculous. We got to set, and he, he, he lays out that timeline. Um, Thing is, is all of Barsh's papers, all of his interviews, everything is now here at MacArthur Memorial. We have, you know, from 70, early 70s through the 90s, Barsh was going through telephone books 
of cities where he knew these guys were from. And he would call everyone with that name. You know, did you, were you related to this pilot or this, you know, air corps, air crewman? And so all of the, it's about, you know, 40 boxes worth of material. It's all here now. And when he does his books, he, he gives that timeline um, very succinctly and uh, gets into as much as he can. I mean, there's still those few gaps, you know, about that, the early morning stuff, you know, what is exactly going on. But it, as far as what all the Air Corps personnel were doing, as far as those glitches being at that one pinpoint position of telling all the pursuit groups, telling all the B-17s exactly about everything coming in and the consternation there, that's all in Barsh. So uh, if you're if you're looking to research, you, you want to come here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jim. Um, what are you going to be talking to us about next week? I think we go to World War One, don't we? I think so, too. On the that's Amanda exactly Williams schedule. show. Yeah, that's right. I love your show, Amanda. <laughs> yeah, well, we love your knowledge, Jim. I don't know how you keep. No, it's these guys' knowledge. I just have to read all of this, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know how you keep all that in your head all the time. Um, but thanks for, thank you for that. We always are interested in all these these interesting details that you know. Um, but we'll be back again next week. I think Monday at noon um, Eastern time. And we'll be talking about um, MacArthur, the 42nd Division, and the 1918 or 1917, 1917, 1917 Christmas, Christmas March. Christmas March. Um, so we'll be back then. Please send us your questions. Um, we're, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can.